what good does it do you to use falsified billing information, compliments of privacy.com, or to use um, delete me to remove your, your information from data brokers, if you could often just Google and find the recorder of deeds, type their name in and boom, you know where they live. Um, so it, it's a problem. And there are a number of solutions to that problem. Today we have Jonathan Steele on, and do you mind just telling me a little bit about yourself and what you work on? Sure, I'm a divorce lawyer uh, by trade. I'm based out of Chicago. Um, I also recently started a uh, privacy and cybersecurity consulting firm uh, that goes by Steel Fortress. So you started working with something not directly related to privacy. So what led you to work on this new thing in your career? Uh, the, the topic has always interested me. Um, I, you know, I've been on Signal and Proton Mail as long as I can remember, going back to probably 2014. Um, but there was a recent um, impetus, I guess, to uh, reignite more of an interest. Um, and I'd say that was a few things that caused that. Um, for one, being a, divor a divorce lawyer in general, um, we're not everybody's favorite people. Um, we tend to uh, aggravate one side or the other and having kids, um, you know, having my home address not readily accessible, um, not Googleable, not in public records uh, became a lot more important when I had kids. Um, and then, I don't know, when everybody else got into baking bread and uh, watching Tiger King during the height of COVID, I went down a, uh, a rabbit hole of privacy and security. I watched hundreds of your videos among others and found it to be sort of a fascinating subject. Nice. And so for you, is it more of that real world privacy that connected with you? Because people have different concerns. Um, I see people concerned about government surveillance. I see people concerned about a more corporate surveillance. And then there's more of that real world privacy of the people around you. Those typically are the three buckets I've seen. Um, and so uh, do one of those speak more to you? It sounds like maybe it's going to be that real world privacy. But do any of the others kind of resonate with you as well? I mean, I think about them on occasion. Um, you know, anonymity is certainly not something that's a huge uh, focus of mine. I, you know, I worry as much as anybody else, probably more so about government surveillance. But uh, the the main concern I have is the real world application and you know physical security for myself and my family. Got it. Um, and I think that's pretty well agreed upon. I think there's some things that the privacy community might discuss that. Uh, the the regular world would go, okay, that seems a little strange. Why do you care about that? But I feel like everyone can kind of get behind the whole like, well, I just don't want people knowing where I live. I have a family. That seems weird, especially in a profession like if you're a lawyer. So um, I think that all makes a ton of sense and people will really resonate with that. Um, one of the reasons you reached out to me, actually, uh, in our original email, which I thought was fun, was you mentioned how, as a lawyer, some of the recommendations that we gave in the past and maybe still do, as well as maybe some other advice that you've seen in the privacy space, legally are kind of iffy. And so um, do you have some examples or some, some things that really spoke to you as, wow, as a lawyer, I don't know if I could recommend that to a client, or I guess what's the nuance to this? A little bit if you can kind of dive into it yeah so you know there's there's a lot of good advice out there um, a lot of it comes from your channel um, I you know I've read Michael Basil's book and found those to be interesting as well um, and a lot of it's uh, a gray area a lot of it is sort of like it depends it depends what you're using some of these tools for uh, whether or not you get into an iffy uh, area so for instance, um, one of the um, common strategies across the board that you'll see is use pseudonyms, use falsified billing information, use um, you know privacy.com credit cards, use uh, my pseudo VoIP numbers, uh, use alias emails. Basically, the you know give as little 
real information as you can, um, as often as you can. And generally speaking, that's fine. Uh, it was a concern of mine uh, at the outset. Am I in sort of a gray area? Is this something that, you know, like CEOs and executives could adopt? Or are they going to have issues at work if they're doing these kinds of things? And for the most part, I think it's fine. Um, I think there are certain areas where that either you can't use a pseudonym or you shouldn't. Um, so one that comes to mind is banking. Um, when you open a bank account, um, a brick and mortar bank, um, ordinarily they give you the option of uh, entering a mailing address as well as a physical address. And you can give them um, pretty much any mailing address you want if you want to get paper statements. Uh, you can use a virtual mailbox, you can send your statements across the country. Uh, but when you are giving them a physical address, uh, you would be uh, pushing it a little bit to give them an address that you don't reside at. Um, similarly, anything government related, uh, if you're dealing with the IRS or the Social Security Administration or the Passport Agency, um, giving them any address other than your real address, uh, you could find yourself in some issues. Um, I endorse and personally use a virtual mailbox as often as I can. Um, I think that if you were to use your virtual mailbox address and it's in a different state and you were to obtain a driver's license in a different state, uh, you could run into some issues there, um, maybe fraud. Uh, for one, you can have some insurance issues about where your, um, your car is actually housed uh, or garaged as the case may be. Um, and if you are doing it to um, get a better insurance rate in a different state, that's probably fraud. Um, I think if you use a, an address that you don't reside in the state for voter registration, uh, that could be voter fraud. If you are entering into contracts um, and using an address that, or better yet, um, a different name that you that's not yours, um, you're probably committing fraud on the person that you're entering into a contract with. Um, if you're buying insurance, whether it's health insurance or auto insurance or life insurance, and you're not giving real information, you're probably committing fraud and it may result in denial of claims or some sort of criminal action. Um, so those are some of the, the, uh, the ones that come to mind. Um, and then again, it's it's just how you're using tools. You know, VPNs are great; they're perfectly legit. Uh, but there are people that use them for things like downloading stuff illegally, and you know that's not a kosher use of it. Um, and then you know, Signal, as I mentioned, is something that I use on a daily basis. Uh, one of the main reasons is the ephemeral nature of the communications. You know, they can. Uh, delete on a timer. Um, and if you're using that just across the board and it's sort of a, a, your routine, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. But if you're using it purposefully for the purpose of destroying evidence and you're in the middle of litigation and you're doing it for that purpose, um, I think you run into an issue with you know your spoilation of evidence and you're not preserving evidence. Uh, so you could end up in uh, some hot water there. Right. Okay, I took down quite a bit of notes as you were talking because I got a lot of questions um, on specific things that you mentioned. And um, hopefully some of the questions will touch on some other questions that popped up for people listening um, because I think it is really important to consider the legal implications, especially for things that are real world stuff like insurance and taxes and the things that are, seem like taboo subjects to talk about, but ultimately most people who watch this probably pay their taxes um, and that's what I'm assuming. Um, and so uh, this might sound like a silly question. Some of these might sound silly, but I kind of want to get into the nitty gritty of this to really understand what is, and obviously people, there's a default answer, but legally speaking, what is a residential address? What if you're somebody who has five different homes? 
what it what has to be your residential address is it a percentage of time that you spend at a certain location what if you're someone who's homeless and doesn't have a home in that case can you not open a bank account what options do those people have so legally speaking what is a residential address it's a good question and it's one that's been tested uh, in the law a few times um, and there's a distinction between a domicile and a residence um, to answer your question, your residence is where you spend the majority of the time, where you, it's, it's more than just where you lay your head at night, it's where you're spending the predominant amount of your time. Um, you know, tests for residence are where you are uh, registered to vote, where, where you file taxes, where you have a driver's license. Those are all usually good indicators of that's your, at least your state of residence. Got it. So it's so uh, you can't really claim like a, a private mailbox or anything like that could be a residence because you're not spending your entire time there is right. a pretty easy way to debunk that. Um, now, I guess another question that came up is you brought up some really good examples about how someone they could purposely defraud insurance or something else for a sole benefit, right? Like I can. Uh, spend less money on my insurance premiums if I register myself in this other place. And there's malice in that, and that's um, something that you can prove wrong. But what would someone like the IRS have an issue with if you're paying all your taxes, you're doing everything by the books, legally you're not doing anything wrong, but you gave them a, not your residential address? I guess what would be the IRS's concern with somebody who's doing that? I think if it's the IRS, um, you know, you're filing a federal tax return, so it doesn't necessarily matter uh, what state you are residenced in for their purposes. Uh, it may matter where you're filing your state tax return, uh, but the IRS just sort of categorically, they want um, truthful information. I, I don't think they have an issue with you listing a virtual mailbox as your mailing address, but anytime they're asking you where you live, um, you can't um, say with a straight face or say with a good conscience that you live in a, a mailbox. Right. That makes sense. Um, and I guess something to touch on. So you mentioned how VPNs uh, could be used for illegal purposes. And so I guess, is there any, have you seen any reason, I guess, within the United States for a privacy privacy tool in itself to be an illegal tool, rather just it being used for illegal purposes. Is that the distinction that that kind of exists right now in the US? Yeah, I, nothing comes to mind where uh, that it's inherently uh, illegal. There, you know, uh, law enforcement has their suspicions about if you use signal, you must be doing something wrong or whatever. Uh, but there, there's nothing that's inherently illegal. It's just what you're using it for, your motive. Got it. And so like, you don't think that people listening should be concerned about using something like a VPN or a signal or a different browser, assuming they're not doing anything wrong? No, I would encourage it. Okay, perfect. Um, and then your signal ephemeral thing uh, reminded me, I read recently about the Amazon case, uh, which I'm sure you've probably been following. Um, and you can probably give a brief introduction to it better than I can. So I'll leave it in your court. But I'm curious for kind of your stance on the whole Amazon situation and how they're being accused of hiding evidence because of signal ephemeral messaging. And they're not the first company that um, has used signal. Uh, they're not, there, there have been politicians that have been accused of using it for the destruction of evidence. Um, and like everybody else, it comes down to their, their motivation. If Amazon is using Signal across the board in lieu of something like Teams or Slack or whatever internal method of communication, and it's just part of their routine. And they, you know, they even have a, uh, a routine deletion set up, a schedule for deletion. I don't think there's anything wrong with it, but if they're using something day-to-day -day like Teams, and all of a sudden they pivot to use Signal and they set a 12-hour deletion timer, it, just, it raises a suspicion of why. Why did you do that? Uh, why was Teams no longer good enough? Why did you need a new deletion schedule? Um, and so it just, it raises questions um, more than it answers them. 
Is that part of the reason why you might suggest to someone they should be using privacy tools now before maybe they're in a situation where they feel like they need them? Yeah, because for one, uh, if it's just your routine and your custom, then you didn't change something for a nefarious purpose. Um, I use Signal all the time. I use Signal when I communicate with clients. I use an ephemeral uh, nature. I, I have an auto delete timer. Um, and there are every once in a while, uh, a bad apple of a lawyer will hit me with a subpoena and say, give me your communications with your client. Now they're privileged and any good lawyer knows that, um, but there are occasions where that privilege um, gets destroyed, whether you're communicating and there's a third person that was a party to the communication or they overheard it or there was no expectation of privacy, whatever. Um, if there's nothing to give, then there's nothing to give. You know, if, if a court were to say your attorney client privilege is gone because of X, Y or Z, turn over what you have and you don't have anything. Well, then you don't have anything, you know, as opposed to you're using iMessage uh, or you're using email and you go in and you manually delete your emails. Well, then you did something wrong. You took it. You actively took a step to destroy evidence um, as opposed to it's just a, an automated thing that is routine across the board. And that's just the way you conduct business. I don't, there's a there's a clear distinction between those two. Right. Um, what's the. What's the term again? There's a formal term for this concept uh, and if people use it in the privacy community. It's um, the ability to claim that you're not doing anything different. Plausible, plausible deniability. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so that's the term that I've heard thrown around to help if people want to dig more into that. Um, now, the big topic that I really wanted to talk to you about, because it's something that I've spoken to an attorney about in the past, and I'm sure many people who are here for probably maybe people who are trying to look for purchasing homes, purchasing anything, um, how to do it privately. Based on my understanding and based on a lot of people's understanding, it's not the easiest thing um, to do. By default, the title is in most areas. Again, please correct me any, anything I say after I'm done introducing the question. The titles of a home are typically public information as well as the mortgage information, which to my understanding is actually the more difficult piece to the puzzle, is the mortgage if you get one. So getting those things privately and keeping them away from public eyes or at least easily available seems to be really challenging. And so I'm opening up a big can of worms with this one, but where would you start if someone came to you and said, hey, I would like to purchase a home don't know where to start, but I just, I don't want people to find where I live. Where do you start with that kind of client? Um, the most common one, and I, it, this, some of this is going to depend on the state that you live in because the laws in different states obviously vary. Uh, but at least in Illinois, the one that you'll most commonly see used is a land trust. Um, and when you set up a land trust, um, which is, it, it sounds more complicated than it is. Uh, it's usually about a thousand to two thousand dollars worth of legal work, and it's maintained or it's held by a title company um, that basically just does the administration, and you pay an annual fee for the maintenance of the trust. Um, the benefit of it is when you do what I suggested, and you go on the recorder of deeds website and you type in someone's name, nothing shows up because the legal owner of the parcel of the real estate is not the person. The owner is trust number 155632. And that's all it says. Um, and you can't download the trust and see who the beneficiary is because that's just not how it works. So if you wanted to buy a piece of real estate, the land trust would own it and you would be the beneficiary of the trust. So you would have the, the power of direction and you're the true owner. But as far as uh, the law is concerned, it's the trust that owns it. So you can you can use the trust at for all intents and purposes as the owner of the, the real estate. And there, there are other ways beyond a land trust. You can have what's called a nominee agreement, which is um, a little dicey, but it's easier to set up. Um, and that, that would basically be 
an agreement between me and you that says I'm going to take title, but I'm really owning it for your benefit. And it's just a piece of paper, a, a written agreement between me and you that says I'm the owner on paper, you're the real owner. Um, that it, why I said it's dicey is that you really have to trust the person that you're nominating to take title uh, because those things can fall apart. The person that takes title can do things that you don't want them to do with it. Um, and then you can end up in litigation. And then there are things where like uh, a corporation or an LLC can take title to property and um, you get some privacy protection and some um, creditor protection associated with uh, the fact that the LLC is the true owner and you are an officer of the LLC. So there are a number of different uh, structures in which somebody other than yourself can hold title. And the effect of that is that you can't just pull the title and see who really owns it and where you really live. Got it. Um, now, I really want to dive more into those three options and a little bit of the differences between them. But before that, I wanted to ask, do you think renting is a valid option to throw by someone? Or does renting also present its own issues? If you're renting, there's no... You know, you're not in the recorder of deeds uh, because you're not owning. Um, so arguably that would be a little bit more privacy friendly than owning if you were to own and hold title to yourself. Um, obviously, the, the financial question is a different one of, you know, whether it's advisable financially. But if you're talking just privacy, you, you probably are better off renting, uh, assuming you trust your landlord, of course. Got it. Um, so... For the land trust, actually, I want to start with the nominee agreement because this seems like the easiest one to tackle here. So from my understanding, nominee agreement is I have a parent and the parent isn't tied to me or I feel like it's less risky for the deed to be held under my parent's name. And so I pretty much say, hey, parent, parent X, can you please, uh, I'm going to purchase this home. I trust you a lot. We're going to do this nominee agreement and you're going to own the home. And then they're on the deed, and then that's it, right? That that's effectively how it works. More often, I'll see lawyers that will be the nominee uh, because there's a fiduciary duty, and you know lawyers are less likely to just make off with your property and deny that there was an agreement and put their license on the line for uh, trying to take someone's property, uh, but. Like anyone else, you need to be able to really trust your lawyer or whoever it is that you're nominating to take title. Got it. So yes is the short answer to your question. Got it. And then how would someone, if they were interested in a nominee agreement, um, how do they find a lawyer that they trust and that they could... It... Is this something that a lot of lawyers will do? Is there a specific lawyer that would do this? Or is this kind of a like, not something you touch with many lawyers unless you really are close with them. I wouldn't want to be nominated uh, by almost anybody to hold title for their property. Um, it would have to be a really compelling reason for me to agree to do that and somebody that I also trusted. Um, so you're probably going to have a hard time finding a lawyer that wants to do that. Uh, it's just it's messy. It's fraught with the possibility for allegations of you know misuse. Um, and as a lawyer, there's just little benefit. There's little reason to want to do it um, for a client. It would have to be somebody that you knew really well or that you were personal friends with or your own family. Um, so you're going to have a hard time finding a lawyer that uh, is going to want to do that. Got it. Um, and now the land of trust. So I'm, gonna, I'm an idiot to this. So from my understanding, I've been told a land trust is like a sandbox. You can put things inside the land trust and then they're in, like you said, trust number X, Y, Z. And then you essentially are the person who owns that sandbox, but that's not publicly available. Is that a decent enough analogy? Is there something wrong with that? Other than taking issue with the, um, the, 
the verb that you own the land trust, um, I think the you're the beneficiary of it, which to a lay person is the same as owning it. Uh, but in the law, it's different. Um, How's it different? And it's, it's sort of, well, that's a good question. Uh, and it sort of depends on what the purpose of it is. If, if you're trying to use a trust for creditor protection, then being the beneficiary uh, can have different implications than if you're the true owner um, and whether or not you're actually creating a separation of identity between the trust and the, the beneficiary or in the owner. Um, the land trust, being a beneficiary, the, another benefit of it is it's easy to, to change beneficiaries. You, you don't necessarily have to do a change of title. Um, if I want to sell you my home, I can just make you the beneficiary of my land trust. Whereas if I'm the owner, I need to effectuate an actual transfer of the interest in it. Got it. This is a really weird comparison, but is it kind of like, you mentioned privacy.com. One of my favorite features about privacy.com is that you don't have to change your credit card information on any of the websites. You can just change the back end. Is that kind of like a beneficiary? You don't have to touch the trust, but you can change the person who's controlling the trust. That's a good analogy. I like that. Okay. Yes. Cool. So you said it's one to $2,000. And is that something you have to do through an attorney or is that something that there are services that exist just for the sole purpose of doing that? So, you know, I know where I live in Chicago, you, you can go to something called Chicago Title and Trust and they'll do it from start to finish. They'll set up the trust. They'll be the person that maintains the trust. They'll be the trustee of the trust. Um, and you'll pay them the sort of initial cost of setting it up and you'll pay them an annual fee for maintenance. Um, so they're a one-stop shop. Um, quick the alternative to that is a lawyer. Yeah. Quick interjection. Is the annual fee some kind of state uh, requirement fee? Is that what that is? I don't think so. I think it's just, you know, they, they have administrative costs associated with just like keeping records and it's not expensive. It's it maybe a few hundred dollars. Okay, cool. Sorry to interject there. Just want to check. No worries. Um, were you, were you saying something else about that? And then the options for setting it up versus an attorney? Sure. If you, if you don't have the option of something like a Chicago title and trust, which I'm assuming most states have something similar, um, and you can just you can go to an attorney and the attorney will do the drafting of the trust, the initial setup of it. And then you can find someone to be trustee of the trust, whether it's a, a banking institution or something like a, a title and trust company. They can be the trustee once you've set up the trust. And how does one decide who to make the trustee? What's the decision making process? Can it be anything? Does it matter? It, it, not necessarily. Uh, if it were me, I would want to use, you know, a bank or a reputable company. I wouldn't want to just use somebody off the street. Um, that, that seems obvious to me, but maybe not to everybody. Um, I would I would steer someone towards a company or a bank that does that as part of their routine service offerings, just because they're going to be more acclimated to how the process works and to keeping your information um, secure. Right. Okay. Now keep in mind, I'm an idiot to this. So what is, let's say you go to Chase and Chase is the trustee for this trust that you set up with Chicago Trusts, this organization. What is Chase actually doing? What is Chase in this equation? What's what are they doing? Are they, they're not the beneficiary, you're the beneficiary, correct? So that's correct. What is the trustee here? What do they, what do they do? They, they're just administering the trust. They're, they're responsible for the day-to-day the -day management of it. They don't have any sort of ownership interest. They're not like a, a contingent beneficiary. They, they don't have any sort of ownership of the actual property within the trust. They're responsible for managing it and maintaining um, the, the operation of the trust. Got it. And so there's operations that occur throughout the year and the trustee is the person who handles those or the entity. That's right. Got it. Okay. I think um, that makes a lot of sense now in the land trust on my end. Are there any things that you want to touch on in the land trust before I ask about the LLC and corporation option? 
No, I think we, we covered it pretty well. Um, that's generally the, the, the route that I would encourage uh, someone to pursue um, if they're trying to get privacy protection. I, I would note that some people think if a, if a real estate is owned within a land trust that it offers creditor protection and it doesn't. Um, so that's a common misconception. And if that's something that someone's looking for, then they're, they're more they're better off going towards something like an LLC owning them. And what is creditor like, protection? Is that if you missed a payment is yeah. No. So it, if, if you default on your credit cards and you, you get sued for collection, or if you get sued for a personal injury tort or something like that, um, all of your assets are subject to garnishment, assuming you lose. Uh, but if the the real estate is not your asset, because for instance, it's owned by an LLC, the home can't be garnished, the home can't be sold, it can't be used to pay off the creditor because it's not your asset. Whereas if you own the home and you have no creditor protection, assuming my judgment is big enough against you, I can force the sale of the home to satisfy my judgment. Got it. So. In the event where, let's say I had a home under an LLC, and for an unrelated case to the home, so something else happened, I, I burned down a building, and it was $400,000 of damage. If the home was under a company, you can't go after the home, but if the home was under a trust, you could go after the home. If it's owned by a land trust, um, there, there are ways of getting at it. Um, that it can be sold in satisfaction of the judgment. Got it. No, no different than if you owned it by yourself. Got it. And so is that the main distinction between an LLC corporation route versus the land trust? Why would someone, if who, what's the kind of client that you would recommend going the LLC route and why? It would primarily from my view be for the creditor protection. Um, it, it, it keeps, creditors away from, assuming you keep um, an arm's length distance uh, in the, tr the dealings of the LLC and the transactions of the LLC, uh, it, it keeps that from being garnished by any of your individual creditors. Got it. And when I, when I say assuming, it's because oftentimes somebody will set up an LLC and then they'll just, they'll use it as their personal piggy bank and they'll uh, they won't follow the, the corporate formalities of an LLC, and then a creditor could come in and try to pierce that corporate veil and say, yeah, it's in an LLC, but it's really yours. You know, you, you banked at, as one. You didn't follow any of the formalities. You didn't have uh, articles of incorporation. You didn't have officers to your corporation. It was just really a shell. Um, then you get in, into a little bit of a gray area. Right. Um, what's the cost difference? You, you quoted one to two thousand dollars for a land trust and then a smaller maintenance fee annually. Um, what would an LLC or corporation be? It would be similar. Um, uh, you know, depending on the state that you live in, there's a, a filing fee with the, the Secretary of State to um, incorporate an LLC. Um, in Illinois, by way of reference, it's $150 to, to file and incorporate your LLC. Um, California is 800. So there's that. <laughs> California is expensive. But, you know, it, so it varies greatly depending on where you are. And it's, that's just a cost. And then there's the fee for if you want to have a lawyer do it, um, which is usually advisable. You know, it's, it's just a form. And to a lawyer, you know, it's easy for me to say it's no big deal. But if you're not a lawyer and you're, you're filling out a form with the secretary of state, uh, it may look foreign to you and you may just be better off paying a lawyer an hour or two of their time to have them fill out the form for you. Got it. Um, and so why would you recommend to most people a land trust if they cost the same and there's creditor protection on the on the LLC? With with an LLC, the, the articles of incorporation and the officers of the corporation um, can be discoverable. You can figure out who, unless you have a registered agent that um, is the person that 
service of process. You know, if the LLC gets sued um, and you have an agent, then it's similar and maybe I would push someone towards um, an LLC. But assuming you don't have a registered agent uh, for your LLC and it's just you, um, then your articles of incorporation will list the officers of the corporation and a relatively savvy person could connect the dots and say, well, Henry is the sole officer of this LLC. So maybe he's the owner of the real estate that the LLC owns. So it, it, it's a little bit less obscurity than just tying a, a, a random series of numbers to a beneficiary that's where the trust itself is not publicly discoverable. Got it. That makes sense. Um, and so the land trust would offer better privacy for a lot of people unless they had an agent. Now, I've seen some really wacky, more complicated workflows where people have the LLC owned by a land trust or vice versa. Is that a thing or is, am I just making that up? It would be vice versa. You could have an LLC that would own a land trust or you could have like a living trust that would own within it a land trust, a life insurance trust, different trusts within a trust. Um, and I guess you're giving yourself different layers of obscurity, but I wouldn't say that you're offering any sort of additional privacy protection at some point it, it's or creditor protection. I mean, you could do an LLC within an LLC within an LLC. Um, and some people do that. And, you know, it, it causes an extra step for a creditor to just have to keep suing down the line. Uh, but I don't think it offers any real additional privacy protection. Right, because if an LLC owned the trust, ultimately you could see the LLC owns the trust and then see the person who owns the LLC, right? Right. Okay. Or the officers of the LLC. Right. Got it. Okay. Um, I feel like I feel very, I feel very much like I understand everything so far. Now, um, I, when I spoke to an attorney in person about this, I think I got generally similar similar information, but the one thing I was told that was kind of the big elephant in the room was you can put a title for a home in a land trust and people won't be able to easily find it. The mortgage is where things get difficult. Is that true? Not from my understanding, no. I, I, I don't think the mortgage would be discoverable if the title itself is not discoverable. So no, that that's not my understanding. Got it. Okay. Maybe it's maybe it's different in California, but that, that's not my understanding here. Yeah, interesting. So I'll have to look more into this because what I was, and again, maybe they were completely wrong. I, I'm I'm just the messenger. So um, what I was told was just because the title is put, um, just because the title is held privately, someone could still look up the mortgage information, and that's kept separate and that's public as well. But I don't know if that's a California specific thing, so I have to look more into that. Um, but that's good to know that that's definitely not a universal thing, um, even if it is a thing, which it might not be a thing. So I don't want to continue giving that more time because <laughs> um, we don't even know if it's confirmed or not. So if a trust, so let's say I'm, I'm going to kind of go through this. I go into your office or I go to an, uh, an attorney different attorney. And I say, okay, sounds like land trust makes the most sense for me. I want to pay the $2,000 to get this set up. And I don't have cash up front. So I want to get a mortgage. Does me trying to get the house under the trust make it harder for me to get a mortgage? Or is it the same thing? Does it make any difference? Some banks are a little bit more reluctant to uh, to finance a loan into a trust just because it can make it more difficult for them to foreclose on the loan if you default. Um, so it, some banks are a little bit more reluctant to give you a mortgage. Uh, but most of them, uh, you know, if you walk into a Chase um, or a Bank of America and say, I want a mortgage, I've got good credit, um, and I'm going to hold title to the land trust, they're going to say, okay. Um, there are going to be the few banks out there that say, uh, I don't know that I want to do that. Um, it causes us a little bit of a headache if we need to foreclose, so go somewhere else. 
Um, so it, it will depend on where you're banking and where you're trying to get a mortgage. But generally speaking, um, banks will give you a mortgage even if you are going the land trust route. So it sounds like the order of operations for someone, and I'm really trying to go go at this as someone who who's listening to this podcast because they're looking to buy a home in three months, so or six months, whatever the timeline is. So step one would be getting a land trust, opening that up, getting it established, and then from there, I assume going to your bank and trying to get a mortgage, and then finding a home or maybe finding a home first. But when you're dealing with purchasing the home, do people make a mistake when it comes to giving the right information? Is there anywhere along this journey where people might make a very common mistake to that jeopardizes their privacy in any way? Yes. Um, if you were to, for whatever reason, because the bank was giving you some pushback in the beginning and your thought was, uh, I just really love this home and the timing is rushed. And so let me just buy it now and I'll put it into a trust later. Uh, that's a problem. Um, if you really need to do it from the start, uh, because anybody can go on the reporter of deeds and just follow the trail. So if Henry buys it on June 7th, and then the next day it's moved into land trust 4646 and the mortgage isn't paid off, Henry still owns it. He just put it into a trust. Um, and people do that and they, you know, they buy a home and they later decide, now I want privacy protection. Now I'm going to set up a land trust. It's too late. Yeah, so do it on your next home. You really, you have to do it from the start to really get any sort of privacy protection. Got it. So it requires planning. That makes sense. So sadly, so I guess this is kind of, I think I know the answer to this and it's kind of a sad answer, but it, let's say I'm a current homeowner and I want to keep my current home and make it private. Do Are there any kind of options that someone might have? Not any good ones. You can put it into a trust, uh, but like I said, you, you go on the recorder of deeds and you just follow that, that uh, transaction from you to the trust and it's easy to see that you're the, still the owner of it. And then there's the problem of if you do that, some banks will say, now the, the mortgage is due right now because it's a transaction. It's, it's a, an exchange from one person to another. We want the mortgage paid off now. And so some people make that mistake and they set up a land trust and they try to transfer the title into the land trust, but they don't have however many hundreds of thousands of dollars to pay off their mortgage. And then they have a problem and they have to get a new mortgage or figure out something quick uh, because it does trigger a uh, due on sale, even if you're not really selling it. Got it. And so just to kind of finish off the mortgage questions, is there any privacy difference whatsoever between paying for a property with cash versus getting a mortgage for it? Outside of obviously that... what the bank knows about you and we're assuming that the interactions you have with your bank are kept with the bank. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose that like any other transaction or any other dealings with a business, anybody else you're sharing information with um, has privacy implications of the mortgage application process. You're basically giving somebody all of your information and how you're sending it to them is a uh, question mark and whether or not it's secure in the way you're sending the information. So, I, I, you know, a mortgage company is like any other company that could leak your information. They could be, suffer a data breach. They could, you know, have a nefarious uh, employee that could do something with your social security number. So I, I imagine there are ways in which uh, the mortgage process could go awry and you'd be, you'd avoid those if you were buying in cash. So in those scenarios, sure. Got it. Um, I think that was really helpful. I feel like I have a much better understanding of this and I hope that other people do too. Um, I have kind of a hypothetical question here. Actually, let me, I'm going to write down the hypothetical question because I have one final question to ask. Is there anyone who's listening or any client that came to you and wanted to do this that you actually wouldn't suggest any of this to? that you think it's better for them not to go through the process of buying a home privately? Not really. I mean, if somebody had no money and couldn't afford the, the setup or the administration, maybe. Uh, 
but it's not expensive. It, it sounds more complex than it really is, no matter which of these routes you end up going. Um, so there's way more benefit than there is downside. And so I would encourage just about anybody um, to try to buy into some sort of privacy protection, whether it's a land trust, whether it's an LLC, whether it's a nominee agreement, something. Perfect. Um, and now the question, the hypothetical I wanted to throw your way, because I feel like a lot of people would fall into this, you know, they get their, their perfect home, they bought it privately, they're really happy, they just moved in. But then what now? You know, if that's your, your one residential address, let's say that you want to apply for a new credit card. I stumbled on this issue, um, tying back to what you said about using mailing versus residential addresses. Uh, I was requested to give more information about the address because they didn't like the address I gave. So, but as you know, you know, if you're submitting a credit application, they're probably going to be sharing that address with the three credit bureaus. And now your address is now with the three credit bureaus. So let's say you're someone who has enough money to get a home. You're fortunate enough to buy a home and you're settled in, but you want to apply for a new credit card. It, does that not kind of devalue the work you've done? In what ways does it devalue what you've done? But also, what options do you have to still, you know, are you looking at a second property now? You know, wh when does it end? It's a good question. Um, and there are, it, it comes down to there's a, an endless um, number of sources of information or sources of data um, that you end up giving your address to. Um, and you could theoretically um, register your credit card to your office address. You could um, start an LLC and open a business bank account and have that business have a credit card. Uh, there are a number of ways that you could try to avoid tying the credit card to a, um, your home address and your, na your name at your home address. Um, but at the end of the day, most people are tying their credit cards to their home address um, out of necessity. And you, you do the best you can. You, you get rid of as many sources of information as you can. Um, and that's the best you can do sometimes. Perfect. Yeah, that's kind of sad. Um, but yeah, there's only so much you can do. Um, actually, when I was on, uh, when I was dealing with this incident, I was on the phone with them and they asked for a residential address. And I said, well, I don't want to give up my address to too many companies. And they said, well, it's only shared with us. And I go, yeah, but you're sharing it with credit bureaus. And they go, yes, we do. And I go, so it's not just you guys then. You know, it's it's kind of a funny thing when you really pry into it a little bit because ultimately these three credit bureaus have so much power over uh, so many people. Um, kind of the last big topic I wanted to touch on, and again, if you, I don't know how you're doing on time, but uh, if you need to go, just okay. let me know. Um, but a big question I've had, as well as many other people, is for those who are the rich, the famous, the celebrities, um, people with money, people who have very, I guess their threats are, are more like, yeah, I can't be discovered or else people might want to actually do physical harm to me because I'm well known. How do they do it? Do they do anything different? Um, do they have specific teams that are in charge of their privacy and security? I assume that they probably utilize things like LLCs and trusts and whatnot um, with lawyers, but how do they do it? How does someone who's really famous kind of go about this whole journey of protecting themselves and their personal information? So largely, I don't think they're doing it differently um, other than maybe they're doing it indirectly. So they might have, as you said, a, either a team that's doing sort of their public relations or they have a lawyer that they have on retainer that helps out with things um, and gives them advice along the way. Um, or they have like house staff that helps with certain things. Um, but they face the same struggles as to everybody else. They just have higher stakes um, for their, str their struggles. They more people want to know where they live than the average person. They have more money to lose. They, you know, there's a, a bigger public interest in their lives than the average person. Um, and there are, there's a number of things that are specific to um, celebrities that aren't available to the, the average person. Um, one example would be um, litigation. 
if you are involved in litigation for whatever reason, um, that's public record. The, the court files are open and somebody can go and pull the court file and they can see all sorts of information about you. Uh, but if you're a celebrity, sometimes that rule gets um, obscured a bit because you can convince a judge to allow you to be John Doe for the purposes of that litigation. If you go into the court and you say, hey, I'm a celebrity, I'm a politician, I'm a prominent person in the community and divulging my identity in the court record would jeopardize my security or you know, compromise my employability in some way, you can be allowed to proceed anonymously in litigation. Um, a recent and well-known example of that would be Donald Trump. If you if you followed the Stormy Daniels trial at all, and you looked at the the settlement agreement that that came out as a result of um, his most recent trial, uh, you won't see his name anywhere on there. You won't see Stormy Daniels' name anywhere on there. You won't see the lawyers' names anywhere on there. Everybody is proceeding as a, a pseudonym uh, in that agreement, and maybe they have a letter agreement between the lawyers that represented. Donald Trump and Stormy Daniels that tied the pseudonyms to the true identities. That's really the only way that you could uh, have an enforceable agreement between the two of them. Uh, but if you just look at it on its face, you wouldn't know that this is Donald Trump. You wouldn't know that this is Stormy Daniels because they don't have their names on anything. Um, so there are certain nuances within at least the court system that are designed to help keep prominent people protected. Um, but aside from that, it's, you know, they, they face the same struggles as everybody else. You know, they, they, they have to protect themselves from oversharing on social media, metadata that comes along with their photos because they have people that stalk them and want to know where they are, when they're there and try to see them in person. Right. Right. I think it's, uh, probably the answer people don't want to hear because people want to want to think that there's some super magic potion they have to make this really easy for them, but um, they have to deal with the same stuff we do. Um, and that's something I always think about too. You know, uh, there have been a few incidents now with celebrities that I go, ooh, I wonder like how they were able to uh, essentially like not have that be a widespread issue with in terms of their privacy and kind of leaking their privacy. And the Donald Trump one I did not know about, so that's really interesting to hear that even they were able to utilize pseudonyms. Um, I guess, how do you feel as um, someone who practices about, I guess, what's the reason for keeping it? I assume I, it's for transparency, but uh, do you think that by default, you know, court records should be public as they are, or are you mixed on it? How do you feel about that? So the public policy behind it is that sunlight is the best disinfectant, that by having everything be public and <laughs> available for inspection and without cost, um, it keeps the integrity of the judicial system. It allows someone theoretically to follow a court case and see that justice is being administered. Um, that's the, you know, the public policy behind it. And to, to convince a judge that you should be allowed to proceed under a pseudonym uh, isn't as easy as it sounds. I've seen um, professional athletes that have come into court and said, you know, I'm special. I, I don't want to have to use my name because I play basketball for a living. And the court will say, with all due respect, you might make a lot of money playing basketball, but that doesn't make you special enough. That, that's not good enough reason for sort of overruling the public interest in monitoring the administration of justice and making everything uh, transparent. So, it, you know, people would get a little bit suspicious of the court system in general if everything was a black box and wasn't as transparent as it is. So I think it's for good reason that it's transparent. Got it. Okay. Um, well, those are all of the core questions I had. Is there anything that we touched on today or anything I didn't touch on that um, you would like to cover? No, I, I think you do a great job with giving advice to people, whether they're celebrities, whether they're the average person. Um, it, it's advice that is uh, solid. It's as long as it's not being misused for some sort of criminal activity. Um, 
it protects everybody the same and it's it's well taken uh and it would just be great if more people uh followed it more people were worried about their privacy um, and i think you're doing a good job of trying to educate people about why they should be yeah i really appreciate that and um, I mean, what you're covering today is also just amazing. And I see this question come up. It's probably one of the biggest elephants in the room that a lot of people don't want to touch. And I do appreciate the fact that Michael Basil is one of the few people who does, um, as you talked about with his book earlier, um, because this is just information that is really hard to access. And I see a lot of legal articles written in legal language. And so actually getting to sit down with someone and ask you know, questions from someone who's kind of an idiot to this, I think is going to be very helpful for people. So, um, yeah, I think you're, you're contributing a lot to this as well. And um, I'm really excited to see what people think about it. So thank you, Jonathan. This was a pleasure. Yeah. Also, um, actually, before we head out, um, you said that you started your own um, kind of resources. Do you want to touch about touch on that for a sec? Yeah, I, you know, I've had clients that for whatever reason, um, in their own divorce cases, they run into issues where uh, they're concerned that their spouse is um, able to read their iMessages or able to get into their emails or looking at their iPhotos or monitoring their surveillance cameras and the list goes up. Uh, and whether those are founded concerns or just sort of uh, suspicions is different for everybody. Uh, but I, I found it useful resource to clients and non-clients alike to be able to sort of guide them through um, the, the maze of privacy and sort of save them from the hundreds of hours worth of research that I've done um, and sort of be able to advise them because some of them, um, they want, they, they're sold on the idea of privacy. They're sold on the idea of security they just don't know how to implement it. Um, and they don't necessarily have the time or the desire to, to learn. Um, and so it's it's easier to seek the advice of someone that they already trust. Um, and some people just want um, the nod of a lawyer that what they're doing is kosher. Uh, because some people have a lot at stake, some people have a lot of money, some people have notoriety for whatever reason. and they might be concerned, is it okay if I'm using a VPN? Is it okay if I'm using a pseudonym? Uh, because if it's not, I don't even want to get into the gray area. But if they have a lawyer that's telling them it is okay, uh, then they, they go into it and they sleep well at night. Um, and I've found it to be a useful resource for people. Um, and so it's sort of a, it ties in with my practice to some extent, uh, but it, it's, it's valuable information um, and assistance for people that value the um, the privacy and security world and just don't know where to start or they don't necessarily want to start. They want to just be able to outsource that or offload that onto somebody else. Great. And uh, Steel Fortress, correct? Yeah. All right. It's my last name and then Fortress. Yeah, it's a good good use of your last name for sure. Um, and I'll leave it linked down in the description um, and then any other links that uh, Jonathan wants me to share so you can find him. Um, Appreciate it. Yeah. Anyway, that's all I have. And I think this is really valuable. So thank you so much for your time, Jonathan. And hopefully uh, people get a lot of value from this. Hope so. Thank you for your time as well. This was great.